Welcome back to our program, Hollywood Structured. As some of you already know, our program is designed to help the young people who wish to enter the entertainment field, may it be music, nightclub work, theater, television, or film. It is also designed to help the parents and the educators of those young people, to help them understand their wants, their needs, and the pitfalls and the traps they may fall into unless thoroughly acquainted with the inner workings of Hollywood. Today, as our special guest, we have someone who went to Northwestern University and got a degree in microbiology. Yes, microbiology. How she ended up becoming director of programming and special project and being the co-creator and ex executive producer with her husband, Bill Bell, of two very well-known soap opera, Young and Restless and Bold and Beautiful, will be the subject of our interview today. Her name is Lee Philip Bell. Hello, Lillian. <laughs> Hello, Lee. Um, before Lee shares her experiences and her expertise with us, I would like to speak to you today about what to wear at an audition. Yes, because you see, what you wear at an audition can influence the result of your audition. Usually, uh, the casting director will call your agent and say, we want to see so-and-so for such and such a role, and you have a vague idea of what to wear. Now, remember that when you go into the office, where there is the casting director, sometimes the director, sometimes the producer, you will be judged by three things. Once, your physical appearance. Two, the credits that you have and how you speak about them. Three, by the reading of the text. Now, let's say that what you are wearing is not pleasing to casting director, director, or producer. That's one strike against you. Let's say that they are not satisfied with your credits and or how you explain them. Two strikes against you. Then what is left for you is to be brilliant in the reading. And remember, you're probably going to be nervous, so that's going to be very difficult. Remember also that the impression that you give to those people that very first time is not a fleeting impression, it is a lasting impression. They will either like you and remember you, or they will not like you and they will try to forget you, all right? And you don't want to be forgotten. Let me say that when you go to an audition, I'll talk to the guys first, uh, and you want to wear the latest fashion, which is uh, torn jeans, torn uh, Levi jacket or leather jacket, spiked hair, an earring, chains around your neck. Now, even if the role requires it, this is how you will be remembered. For roles like a rebellious person, homeless person, a junkie, a drug dealer. There are more roles than that to be played on the air. You don't want to be remembered just as that one character. For you ladies, if you don't know what you're supposed to wear and you say, oh, I've got to look pretty, However, you wear a very mini skirt and a blouse that's open down to here, long earrings and a lot of makeup. That's how you're going to be remembered. I've often said in the show that in Hollywood, when you first start, the longer the earrings, the shorter the rolls. So what should you really wear when you go to an audition? If you know, for example, I'll take two extremes, that you're going to be reading for a policeman or a fireman or a policewoman or a firewoman, then try to wear darker color. Dark pants, dark skirt, uh, dark shirt, black or blue shirt, so that they have an impression of you that is relating to the character. If you're supposed to be a doctor or a nurse, wear something light or a nice business suit. If you don't quite know what to wear, 
I would advise the young women to wear a nice dress, but always carry a jacket with you. So that when you go in the office, if the role requires that you are a businesswoman, you can wear the jacket on top of the dress. If you are supposed to be a very relaxed person, then maybe you can open the button of your shirt or of the dress and look fairly relaxed. For the guys, wear a nice pair of pants or jeans, if you don't own a suit, a nice shirt. Always carry with you a tie and a jacket. When you get to the office finally and they give you the script, you find out what you should wear. You are prepared. Remember, the key word for everything you do in this industry is to be prepared. Now, remember to dress the way you want to be remembered. Remember to dress the way you want to be spoken to. That's the secret. Enough for me. Now, let's go to Lee and that share. That was wonderful. I wish I had heard that uh, 35 years ago. Really? <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> right. Good. Uh, Lee, where were you born? In Chicago. In Chicago. Uh, were your parents in the entertainment field? No, not at all. No? No one in the family, no. So you came out different. Yes. But when you were a child, you didn't particularly want to be in the entertainment field. No, my father was a florist, and, uh, and I just automatically thought I would become a florist because I worked for him every day, and especially on weekends and holidays. But um, I went, I went uh, you mentioned I was a microbacteriologist. Uh, I was taking botany at Northwestern. And, uh, to go with the, the job of florist, yes, yes, to, to I, learn all about flowers. Exactly. And um, at one semester, there wasn't, my botany course was filled. So I had to take another one. So I took a limnology course, which is part of bacteriology. And there were things moving, you know, in the microscope when I looked <laughs> down there. And I thought, wow, this is great. So I took then bacteriology, then microbiology, and I, my uh, feelings changed. I thought I wanted to be um, someone in a hospital that looked into the microscope and... Does research? Yes, I wanted to cure the world. You know, I was going to find the one cure. Well, may I say that you're finding a cure to the world at this point. You're entertaining the world, which is fine with your shows. Yes, thank you. Um, now, um, you are now in school, and you think you're going to teach or you're going to do research in a hospital. What happened? Do you ever get to the hospital? Do you ever get to do research? Well, what happened was when I graduated from Northwestern, I realized that I didn't want to look at little things in a microscope all the time. <laughs> I wanted to, to uh, help people. So I wanted to become a social worker. And I went back to school to ask them what I would have to do to become a social worker. And mm -hmm. they say, you have to go back to school for two more years. And I said, oh, I just finished four years of college. I don't want two more years. But um, the woman said you could, do, you could do it another way. You could get a job with the county mm -hmm. as a third-class social worker, and you could work and learn your job. You know, it would be on-the-job training. So I thought, well, that's wonderful. So I went to the county, and I took the test, and I, I put my name on a list. Yes. And, um, and so I was going to become a social worker. I talked to my father about it, and... Um, he was not too thrilled about that, but he wanted you to go in the florist business. Yes, still. Yes, but he didn't. He didn't make me. You know, it was my older brother <laughs> that said, "Look, the folks have spent all this money on your education, and you've been living the free life for four years. Now you come back and work for them for two years, and then go do what you want." So is that what you did? I did. Yes, because <laughs> I always did what my big brother told me to. I still do. <laughs> <laughs> Still makes me angry, but uh, I was working in the flower shop, and um, my dad received a phone call, and it was from the Allied Florists Association, uh -huh. and they wanted him to come down and be on television, and uh, this was in 1950, and my father, were, the television sets were about this big, yes. <laughs> and a big box, but a little screen. And my father said no. And they wanted him to come down to be on daytime television. He said nobody watches television. About the flower? Yes, he was going to arrange yes, flowers. Yes. He said, no, I can't. I'm busy. But I will uh, send my son down. That was J.R. Yes. So J.R. went, and he took me as his assistant. 
Well, he did the flowers, and uh, he did a wonderful job. He was very, very good. And after he was finished, the uh, director came out and said, you know, we've been looking for someone like you because they've had a different florist on yes. every week on a, a, a show. And the florists mostly do the arrangements from here, like you paint a picture, yes. you know? And so the people out there couldn't see anything. And then at the last minute, they'd turn it around. Yes. And then you could see what was happening. Well, uh, they said, could you do it backwards? And my brother said, no, I'm busy next week. So he said, but my little sister will come, and she can oh, do anything no. you want. And the director looked at me, <laughs> and he said, can you arrange flowers backwards? And I, of course, I couldn't arrange them forward that well, so I could do them backwards <laughs> just as well. So that's how I became uh, a florist on television. And then that went into... Uh, a real program, an interview show, and a news show, and a children's show. How did you show. get the interview show, though, from well, arranging flowers on the air? I arranged flowers on the air on my day off, on Monday was my day off. Mm -hmm. And I would go down to the, to the uh, station, and I would arrange flowers, and I would uh, arrange them backwards, and I would have music on, and I would have themes. You know, I would have one. that you had chosen. Yes. Oh, sure. I'd plan it all week long. I see. I would plan, and uh, once I had um, flowers for new babies, and I had the cradles and the the stork and the flowers, the baby's breath, the sweetheart roses, the bachelor mm -hmm. buttons, all that. And I was about to go on, and a piece of scenery fell from over my left shoulder on the table yes. and smashed it off. So there was just time enough for the uh, stagehand to come along with this dirty, wet cloth, and whoosh, all, all of it was gone. <laughs> and so then the floor director went like that, and I started talking about uh, spiral eucalyptus, uh, dried flowers, <laughs> fresh flowers, silk flowers, any kind of flowers, and I talked for 10 minutes. And then he, he went like this. No, the first thing, yes, he went like this, and I thought, He's angry. He's angry because the flowers are gone. And then uh, uh, he went like this, and I knew it was, I was finished. God. So I said, I'll see you next week. Goodbye. Oh, no. So I did that for a year. And then when Lucky North, who was the first woman in the country, at least this was what I was told, to have a, to be uh, the first woman announcer. Yes. So she would announce the programs all day long, and Art Linkletter was on, yes. and Gary Moore was on. She would announce the station breaks, and then she would do three show, three live shows in between. She was the only person, only talent at the station from seven in the morning until three in the afternoon. So she did everything, and she was going on a vacation to Japan, <laughs> and uh, so she wanted to pick a someone that could take her place and she didn't want the well-known actresses around town because they were too good there was Carmelita Pope and Vera yes. Ward and uh, Casey I, Angel Casey so she took the flower girl she took Miss Petunia that was me this is wonderful. Yes. and so she said will you take my place and I said yes sure she said well stick around maybe they'll give you a call so I was home with my mother wiping dishes, and I got a call first from the county. They said, your job as a third-class social worker is ready. And I went back and I told my mother I, I had the job as a third-class social worker and I was going to start. And then I got another phone call. It was from the, the uh, station manager. It was WBKB in Chicago, Channel 2. And uh, he said, would you like to be a substitute for two weeks while Lucky goes on vacation? And I said, I'd love it. <laughs> and, so and that was a turning point in my your mother said, career. What should, I mean, I, I asked her what I should do. She said, go on television because you won't last more than two weeks, and then you can be a social worker. <laughs> so that was how I started. You know, we had uh, Henry Mancini on the show. Oh, he's and wonderful. His father said to him after he won, the night he won his first two Oscar, he said, you know, you better go back to school and get a job. <laughs> a regular job. <laughs> a real job. Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> a real job. Yeah. Okay, now, let's jump to, now you become a regular on the show and you stayed for what? How long? 18? 30, 30 years. Thir 30 years I was in Chicago on television. The little flower girl made it good <laughs> in 30 years. No, now, what it was, was that I could work, but what my florist background taught me was that I could work from 7 in the morning until after 10 o'clock at night, 
I could do the station breaks because after I started the job, then there was a 10 o'clock show that I had to do. So I see. be there at 7 in the morning and do the station breaks. I used to rehearse uh -huh. the station breaks. Uh, they were the hardest. And then um, I'd do the shows. And at 10 o'clock, I'd go home. I, I roomed with three girls from college. And um, I'd go to sleep. And then I'd get up. And I'd go to work. And I did that for two weeks. And they had never had anyone that did that. I mean, it's, it's seven days a week now. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it was nothing to me. Because in the florist business, we work on holidays from 5 in the morning until 3 the next morning. And then you go to sleep for two hours and you start again. But anyway, so it was fun for me. Okay. So now, how did you get the, how did you become co-creator of Young and Restless? Well, I was lucky enough to marry Bill Bell. <laughs> <laughs> and he was in advertising and I was in television. Yes. And um, we met and we fell in love almost instantly. And uh, I thought, I've got to marry this man. He's wonderful. And he was thinking the same thing. And then a year later, we were married. Now, was he thinking of writing uh, for soaps well, at the time? not necessarily. He had written a book called The Rat Race. Mm -hmm. And he was writing another book. So I encouraged him to quit his job at the advertising agency, where he was doing very well. Mm -hmm. They didn't want him to quit. Mm -hmm. Uh, they wanted him to work part-time or sometime, or they, they just didn't want him to go. But um, he said that he, he didn't want to be in advertising for the rest of his life. He liked it, but he didn't want to do that. So I said, well, quit your job because I'm working and we have no responsibilities. We lived in a one-room uh, <laughs> apartment, apartment with a pull-down bed. <laughs> and we were gone all day, so there were, the window looked out at another window. I mean, there, were, you know, there was this much room between the Space buildings, in between. so there was no sunlight in the apartment. But we weren't there in the daytime. And on weekends, we would visit his mother or my mother, and it was wonderful. Um, so he quit his job. It took a long time for me to talk uh -huh. about it. He quit his job, and he hadn't told me that he used to work with Erna Phillips' niece. And, she, and he talked her into getting him... Um, an introduction to Erna Phillips, and Erna Phillips was the queen of the soap opera from radio, the transition mm -hmm. from radio to television. So he got uh, an interview with Erna, and she hired him the day after he had quit. And, and he was excited. So he was writing then for, for... He started writing then. But I was angry, because I had talked him into quitting, and here he had a job the next day. So that was all right. Now, um, so, but while you, you created uh, both the Young and Restless, you still lived in Chicago for a long time. Oh, yes. You, you didn't move to California until lately. No. Uh, Erna Phillips lived in Chicago, and she had lived in New York, and she had spent a good amount of time out mm -hmm. here. And she said that when you write a soap opera, you should be in the middle of the country, so you have the views of the whole country. Mm -hmm. And Bill believed that. Now, is that, is that the reason that you have writers that write for you? Some of them are in Hawaii, in Chicago, in Chicago here. Phoenix, yes, and here. Yes, because we want the ideas from all over the country to be in, in the soap. We're not there uh, to please, especially to please, the East Coast or the West Coast. Um, so that's, and plus, when we had children, I made a, a bargain with Bill that we would stay in Chicago until they'd finished their high school education mm -hmm. and were off to college. I see. Now, you were speaking, um, I'm sure the young people would be interested, you were speaking of the many hours that you spend while you were a florist and on TV. Now that you're a producer, is time easier for you? <laughs> Please tell me. This is the hardest job in the world. Uh, Bill and I go to bed about 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night. He's up at 5 in the morning. He exercises. He has his breakfast, which is cereal and milk and toast. And he writes at home. 
until about 8 o'clock or sometimes 7 o'clock, and he'll come down to work. Well, for the first three years I was here, I would come with him then, and, uh, and I would go to work as the producer. Now he goes to work at 7 or 8 o'clock, and I come about 8.30, because I have a home to manage also. I have to, we have a, a lady mm -hmm. that, that cooks for us, and she's there five days a week. And uh, we have a, a wonderful uh, gentleman that is our gardener. And uh, you, in other words, you manage I, the office and the home at the same time. Right. Well, I have to tell them what to do first. And then I have to come to the office and then just totally forget home and, and work at the office. And uh, may I ask, are you involved, because I'm sure they, they, they want to know, is the producer involved in the soap opera in the casting of the character? Oh, yes. Yes, I was initially. Initially, we, we auditioned about 500 people for the 17 roles on The Bold and the Beautiful. The 500 were then taken down to about 100, and these are by the casting directors, mm -hmm. and we didn't see them. Then they're taken down to about 100, and then, then we looked at about 50 people. Did you test them all oh, yes. on film? Uh, not, no, we, we, uh, we would get in a long row, you know, just like you would see in an audition. There would be the producer and the director and the casting director and the so-and-so and the other producer. So uh, we would have them read for us, and if they were very good, we would ask them to come back and put their mm -hmm. audition on tape. Mm -hmm. So when we, we audition, maybe... Uh, 30 or 35 people on tape and 50 people in, in real life. What, and I'm sure this is important for them, what guides you to what you think will work in an actor? Well, we were fortunate in that Bill has been in, in uh, daytime television for 30 years also, mm -hmm. and uh, he has worked on Guiding Light, As the World Turns, Days of Our Lives. He and Erna created another world, and then he was asked to create a show, so we created mm -hmm. The Young and the Restless and The Bold and the Beautiful. So he knows a good deal about this. Uh, he, when we came out here, we locked ourselves in a hotel room until we came up with the concept, mm -hmm. the whole mm -hmm. concept. We'd been talking about it for a year. And our sons, uh, Bill and Brad, had a couple ideas, and our daughter had some ideas. But we sat down, and, and Bill wrote, and I wrote, until we had um, an initial concept of the, of the idea. And then Bill thought about the actors that he had worked with. Mm -hmm. And he thought, if I could get Susan Flannery mm -hmm. and John McCook, mm -hmm. we would have a beginning. These will be the mm -hmm. core characters, the mature mm -hmm. and very fine actors. So he called uh, Susan and she said yes, she would, I think she said she'd like to think about mm -hmm. it for a while mm -hmm. because Susan is a director yes. also and she was um, directing as well as acting and Susan has won many awards and been mm -hmm. on Dallas and Towering mm -hmm. Inferno and so forth. So. Right, so he got those two and Eric was, had been in, in uh, legitimate stage mm -hmm. and he's a singer and it, oh, mm -hmm. he's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So we got those two, then that took it down to about 15 and um, oh Jim Storm also, mm -hmm. he, was, he was another core character and Lauren Coslow, Bill had worked with before. So now we're down to about um, 13 or 12. So the, now these are the young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had created the character of Caroline Spencer, mm -hmm. who was a well-educated, um, just a lovely person. She, uh, she was just like what you would want for a daughter or something like that. I mean, just perfect. And in finally came this girl who looked like Carolyn Spencer, talked like Carolyn Spencer. She was Carolyn Spencer. And she was the fiance of Ridge. Yes. And Ridge had to be handsome, talented, uh, have a little edge to himself because he was a little, little cocky. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and so in came Ron Moss and he was Ridge. So I guess it's when you see the character in your mind and then on paper 
and then the person comes in and they are and it. it hits you. <gasps> now that doesn't always happen. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, this is the uh, three minute time in which you have two minutes now to address directly uh, either the young people or the parents or the educators. Camera is all yours. Thank you, Lillian. I admire your show so much. Bill and I have watched, and we, we just think it's a great help to people. Thank you. And I hope that what I say will be a help. Um, I think that I've, see, I've seen, like Lillian, so many young people here in Hollywood that come in and they want to be a star, and they want to have a speaking role at the beginning. And I, I give their picture to our casting director, uh, Christy Dooley, and she does, she files them and categorizes them and so forth. I think it's wonderful to be an actress or an actor or a musician or a director or a camera person or a lighting person or makeup. Uh, you need a dream. You need a dream. You also need a job. <laughs> and uh, I think that it's, I, I don't know whether I should say this or not, but I think it's up to the parents to guide their children through education and through special classes and any way they can to be able to make a living, whether it be as a street cleaner, as a waiter, as a uh, secretary, as a makeup artist, whatever it is. They, they should be able to work and make a living. That's number one. And then, uh, then you start to go after, I mean, all, all through your life you should be training for your job as an actress or an actor, unless you don't make up your mind quite so soon. And then, then you should go after it. But you Thank should you. be able to make a job, to, to earn a living and to have a job first. <sighs> too fast, too fast again. <laughs> I would like to thank Lee for sharing her experiences and her expertise with us. And remember, you people out there, please keep watching us because we keep watching out for you. Thank you. Be well. Keep the faith. Till next time.